All kidding aside, I was in London two weeks ago just for a day, and uh, that is one of the places it's really happening. And if you want to know who we should worry about, you worry about everybody. But London is a city that really is doing an awful lot of things right, and it has a lot of the natural advantages that New York does in terms of where it's located and a diverse population and scale and everything else. And uh, what really annoyed me is I was talking to a restaurateur and he said all of the avant-garde things in food happening in London, not in New York. Now, I made a commitment when I was elected to eat in every restaurant in New York City. It turns out there are 25,000 of them. Uh, my waistline says I've made a stab at it, but I haven't quite got to where we want to be. Anyways, thank you, and um, uh, James, thank you, and to everyone at the Aspen Institute and the Atlantic for working with us to create this great event. Uh, many of you are from far-flung cities and nations. Six of the world's continents are represented here. So on behalf of 8.4 million New Yorkers, welcome to the city that a good friend and one of our greatest mayors, the late Ed Koch, once described as the place where the future comes to audition. Now, with all due respect to the late Ed Koch, I think the truth is more and more that the future is auditioning, not just in New York, but in innovative cities around the globe. Uh, very few things that we do here in New York City that haven't been done elsewhere. Uh, bicycles, for example, rental bicycles were started in Lyon, went to Paris, went to London, went to Chicago and Boston, and then came here finally. And uh, one of the great successes, and people say, oh, I'm surprised. This is something that was tried in so many different places, you knew it was going to work. And uh, why it took us so long is a long story. But nevertheless, uh, we've borrowed from around the world. And things go in the other direction. Uh, the smoking ban was originally started in California. Nobody tried and paid attention to it. But when we banned smoking in the workplace here in New York City, out of that, all of Western Europe is now smoke free. Virtually all of Latin America is smoke free. Some of the Asian countries are starting to um, pass sensible smoking regulations, and virtually every major city in the United States, including those in tobacco growing states, uh, are smoke free in the workplace. So things go in both directions. And the question we really have is how can cities shape our future? And that's what City Lab is all about, and it really is an increasingly important. Uh, question. Uh, today, for the first time in history, a majority of people on Earth live in cities. By mid-century, three-fourths of the world's population are expected to be city dwellers. So think about that for a moment. Uh, when I was growing up in suburban Boston, the suburbs were the future. And the middle-class dream was to escape the city with its filth and grime. Uh, by the time I arrived in New York in 1966, cities were decaying. In the 1970s, not only did many people leave cities across the United States, so did most of the manufacturing jobs that had built the middle class. And the question back then wasn't whether cities could be saved, the question was, were they worth saving? And many people really thought, if you go back and read the press, that they weren't. It was the golden age of the suburb, and it defined the second half of the 20th century in the United States and other countries as well. But today, I think we can officially declare that the golden age of the suburb is over, and it has been replaced by a new urban renaissance that is redefining the future. Now, City Lab is our effort to expand and to extend that urban renaissance in new ways to more places, and we certainly aren't waiting for national governments to lead the way, because we would be waiting for a very long time. Um, as we all know here in the United States, if you just contrast what's happening in cities compared to what's happening in Washington, uh, the cities are, people are, are working across party lines as we're doing today to solve problems in new creative ways. In Washington, the partnership, uh, partisanship has gotten so bad that the two parties can't even agree on how to keep the lights on. And we are uh, pioneering new ideas. Uh, they are paralyzed by dysfunctional politics, and I think the contrast could not be even starker. Uh, the fact is Washington is increasingly unresponsive to the needs of our country, and cities are filling the void in a very big way by taking actions to address the most pressing challenges of our time. Now, ironically, it was Washington policy that helped fuel uh, the age of the suburb. 
uh, but the urban renaissance were experiences happening despite Washington and not because of it. It is a renaissance that is being led by cities themselves, not just here in the United States. Cities around the world have become laboratories of government innovation and global cooperation. And now, even though every city faces unique circumstances, we all face the same kind of challenges. The need for more jobs, safer streets, better schools, cleaner air, greater transit options. Uh, the more open space, the more uh, modern infrastructure, the list just goes on and on and on. And since we all face these challenges together, it only makes sense that we talk about them together, and that's what we're meeting here to do. Uh, that's why we have here to listen to each other, to learn from one another, and to leave here with new ideas, because more than ever, uh, what happens in one city, uh, if successful, can spread to other places. As I said earlier, uh, we've certainly seen this, I uh, mentioned the smoking ban, but there are other uh, examples. Uh, there's the old saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, uh, but in New York City, what happens, the success that we've had here, uh, we hope to spread to cities all around the world. And we know that innovation doesn't come easy in city government. We know that bureaucracies, uh, even at the local level, are notoriously risk adverse, and that in city government, competition can be a dirty word. Uh, in any city, agencies, uh, city agencies all too often isolate the people that ought to be working together. Uh, we have red tape in the cities and regulations that threaten to smother new ideas. Uh, but nevertheless, if we want government to be more effective and to do, do more with every precious public dollar, there is really no choice. We've got to overcome such barriers. We've got to enable cities to innovate. And that's why we have made government innovation, especially at the city level, one of Bloomberg Philanthropy's top priorities. I was fascinated in watching what goes on in Washington. Uh, they just the other day voted 450 to zero or something like that. Uh, to uh, continue guarantee the pay of everybody that's been furloughed. So their idea of a work stoppage is to stop the services to the city but not stop the expenses of the public. You cannot write this script. In fact, if you were going to try a movie on it, nobody would produce it. It is so impossible to believe. Now, we are committed here to bring other funders on board, and we're telling funders that if you really want to make a positive change, invest in the city labs around the world. Here in New York, public-private partnerships have helped us fund innovative new experiments in problem solving on a broad range of issues from education to the environment to the economy. And this fall, a report on our experience with public-private partnerships will be released highlighting the key lessons that we've learned and we'll send it to everyone here because we really know how important it is that such partnerships, are, how important they can be to cities around the world. In fact, the 30 mayors uh, here today rank public-private partnerships as a top strategy for driving innovation and I think that's absolutely right. Uh, New York City has raised, I think in the last 12 years, something like $400 million in private money for uh, the Mayor's Fund to advance New York and a couple of other funds that do exactly the same thing. And what you can do with public-private partnerships are things you can't do with just public money. The public demands to know in advance what you're going to do with their money and a guarantee that will work. Unfortunately, innovation does not work that way. Innovation, the essence of it is you don't know who's going to buy it, you don't know what it's going to be called, you don't know what color, what it's going to be made out of, you don't even know what it's going to do. And you have no guarantees that it's going to work. And in fact, if it doesn't work in science, that's something useful because at least you know not to go down that path again. Uh, the public, on the other hand, wants answers to all of those questions in advance. And if it doesn't work, it is a total failure. And you are forever tagged with the term failure. I am still known as the mayor that did not bring the Olympics to New York City. Uh, thank God. <laughs> not that I wouldn't have loved to have the Olympics, but we were going to fund it with private monies. And then there was a little thing called the mortgage crisis that got in the way of that. And I stopped to think, how would we ever raise that money? Having said all that, almost every single thing, with the exception of, I think, a velodrome on Staten Island, almost every single one of the things that we were going to build has been built. A new Madison Square Garden in Brooklyn, uh, two new baseball stadiums, a new football stadium, all the housing, another subway line, all of these things we've managed to get done anyways. 
Um, but the public wants to know in advance. Innovation doesn't work that way. That's why we need to bring in private philanthropy. To spur even more innovation at the local level, last year at Bloomberg Philanthropies invited major cities across America to propose breakthrough uh, solutions to problems that they face. It was an idea called the Mayor's Challenge. It was designed to encourage city leaders to stick their necks out and to try new things. And they certainly did respond. More than 300 cities across America submitted ideas. We selected five winners. The grand prize was awarded to Providence, Rhode Island for an innovative new approach to early childhood education designed to increase the vocabulary that children hear in their homes on a daily basis. Four other cities received grants as well. And the response to the mayor's challenge was so enthusiastic and the ideas presented were so visionary that two weeks ago we invited mayors of Europe's major cities to take part in a similar grant competition. And as with the American mayor's challenge, we're confident that this European mayor's challenge will generate new ideas and innovations that many cities can learn from and replicate themselves. And one of the criteria for winning was your idea had to be something that could be used elsewhere. And in fact, when we reduced the number of competitors from 300 to 20, the top 20 came together and we worked in a room where each one helped improve the other city's ideas and made them more palatable. So it really was a collaborative effort, even though everybody wanted to win. And we think the same thing is going to happen in Europe. Um, Bloomberg Philanthropies is developing and testing other models of, to foster innovation in cities around our nation and worldwide. For example, we have something called innovation delivery teams that we support, and they're helping mayors in five cities that won that competition to break down the barriers to change and come up with new ideas and cross institutional barriers to address urgent problems. And in a similar fashion, the nationwide cities of service effort that we support has brought power to what we call the impact of volunteering to more than 170 cities and more than 50 million residents from coast to coast. And we're thrilled that just recently the United Kingdom has started to replicate our cities of service as well. The president really started it all when he called for this nation to be a nation of volunteers. And I remember we sat there and Patty Harris looked at me and said, well, why shouldn't we do it? And we went out and created something where we gave grants to some cities to hire somebody to run their volunteering efforts. It was so successful that a lot of other cities started taking public monies and hired their own uh, head of volunteerism. Uh, another promising program is something called Art Place, which supports community development through grassroots arts project and a new city energy project funded in partnership with the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation and the Kresge Foundation will support work by the National Resources Defense Council, NRDC, and the Institute for Market Transformation. And the, <coughs> the objective there is to encourage 10 American cities to improve the energy efficiency of their largest public and private buildings. And that will take a major step towards reducing the energy costs for those cities and their taxpayers. It will improve the air in those cities and across the country and arguably around the world uh, by shrinking the carbon footprint of those cities. In New York City, we made a commitment to reduce the overall carbon footprint 30 percent uh, by, uh, I think it was 2030, we're over halfway there already. And it really is, in New York City, it is big buildings that produce pollution, whereas in other cities it's transportation. But because we use mass transit and walk and the density, it's the buildings that are a great culprit here. And with some innovative financing from, I think it's Deutsche Bank and J.P. Morgan Chase, um, we've been able to get loans for building owners to convert from using the heavy polluting number six oil, go to natural gas, which improves their bottom line and also improves the air quality where they live. We did a study we took uh, where kids in the winter show up to hospitals with asthma attacks and we plotted where they live. And it was a map of the major arteries in New York City. If you live near those major arteries, so the big trucks that come through, we've got to do something about. But the big reduction has come from getting buildings to switch their energy source. Now, our work is not confined to the United States, far from it. The Global Road Safety Program that we focused on works in more than 30 cities to reverse the rising tide of traffic fatalities and injuries in the rapidly developing and rapidly motorizing nations of the world. Our initiative, as we know, to uh, reduce tobacco works in more than 150 cities in the low and middle income countries that are home to more than two thirds of the world's smokers. And our strong commitment to the C40 cities climate um, 
uh, leadership group, an organization that has been my privilege to chair for the past three years, brings more than 60 cities from around the world, including New York, to support one another's great efforts to shrink our carbon footprint and mitigate the impact of climate change. Um, federal governments and state governments are doing, I think it's fair to say, nothing in terms of addressing the environmental problems. That actually is overstating uh, what they're doing because they've passed lots of legislation which is going in the wrong direction. Uh, but uh, the cities, uh, if the cities that are in C40 were a separate nation, they would be the third largest population, the second largest economy, and the fifth largest carbon footprint on Earth. So our combined potential for reducing greenhouse gas emissions is the equivalent of taking all of the cars off every road in the entire United States, and we have a really ch good chance to do this. These cities are committed. Now, all of that work and much more is helping to drive innovation in cities around the world, and along with our colleagues at the Atlantic and the Aspen Institute, and along with the underwriters of this conference, who you should give some business to. I think that they would love to have you patronize their and buy their products, whatever. Uh, Citibank, Hitachi, General Motors, McKinsey, uh, Amazon website, and the Rockefeller Foundation and Living Cities. Uh, they all believe that the City Lab Conference will move this process forward. Uh, it's a process that will begin with the panel that follows us this morning. Uh, Richard Florida, the Atlantic's editor-at-large on cities, will moderate that panel, which will include the director of the Brookings Institution's Metropolitan Policy Program, Bruce Katz, who has just written an important new book called The Metropolitan Revolution. I'm sure it's available from Amazon, and he'd love to sell the book, I'm sure. Anyways, uh, they'll focus on a subject in this panel that is seriously, that is always at the top of any city's agenda, and that is the economic development that creates opportunity and jobs. Joining them will be Nashville Mayor Carl Dean, uh, Carol Coletta, Vice President of the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, and New York City's Deputy Mayor for Economic Development, Bob Steele, who's the principal architect of the largest and most creative economic development initiation uh, initiative that this city has ever seen, or certainly seen in, in my lifetime. That competition has, uh, uh, has succeeded in bringing three major new applied science campuses to New York City, uh, which will create the jobs of the future. Bob will have more to say about that later. But suffice it to say that this will dramatically deepen our city's pool of engineering talent and spin off new products, new business startups, and tens of thousands of new jobs here for years to come. Uh, over the rest of today uh, and tomorrow, there'll be breakout sessions on topics ranging from jump-starting the venture environment to innovative transportation solutions to cultural investment and from making our cities safer to making them healthier. And they'll feature some of the leading thinkers and policymakers in these areas, including a uh, number of current and former leaders of our administration here in New York City. Tomorrow, you're also <coughs> You can take some field trips, giving you the behind-the-scenes look at the most innovative projects in our city. And tonight, you'll have a chance to take part in a discussion at NYU on a topic of the utmost urgency in that. And we've done an enormous amount of work on that here in New York uh, climate change. It'll begin with James Bennett's one-on-one -on -one interview with someone who is extremely knowledgeable and deeply passionate on the subject, former Vice President Al Gore. Uh, for the record, he deserves uh, credit for our, I don't know about the internet, but um, <laughs> the white roofs in New York City, when you fly in and out of New York, take a look and you'll see 80% of the roofs must be painted white. If you have a five-story building, just paint your roof white, your electric bill goes down 25%. And you look at the few buildings that are not painted and you wonder what on earth is going through their heads? Why do they just send money to Con Ed for absolutely nothing? Uh, but the truth of the matter is Al uh, was one of the leaders of that, and he and I were on a roof painting. I'm happy to report I didn't get any white paint on my shoes or my suit, but uh, we did paint the roof, and I assume it's still painted white. Uh, in addition, we've invited 30 mayors who are here today, seriously, to take part in what we're calling a Mayor's Innovation Studio. It is a series of a facil of facilitated conversations drawing out ideas about how to, uh, uh, how to put in place the structures and resources that will make innovation a routine part of city government. That is a topic that, as you know, is close to the heart of every mayor here because mayors are elected to solve problems, not play politics. Uh, mayors don't have the luxury of talking about change. We have to deliver it. 
We can't shut down our government like they did in Washington. We have to provide services need, uh, that uh, people need every single day, and we have to find ways to keep delivering them more efficiently and effectively. We don't print money either. We have to find a ways to raise revenues and to justify the use of those revenues to the taxpayer, something that Washington is conveniently free from having to worry about. And that's what makes our cities laboratories for producing the urban solutions to global challenges. And uh, we think this conference will uh, help solve that. So just let me close by noting that in medieval times, it was said that city air is freer because cities destroy the shackles of feudalism fuel great, uh, greater prosperity for all and unlock human creativity and imagination. And today, working together, we can help cities do that again. So on that note, let me turn things over to Richard Florida and this morning's panel, and thank you all for coming.